Hello everyone. Huge welcome to this event, which focuses on Wild in Campus East and is supported by Ron and Barbara Cook. My name is Claire Hughes. I'm Director of Learning and Teaching and Deputy Head of Department in Environment and Geography at the University of York. And I'm gonna be chairing this event. So I'll first run through a few technical notes be before introducing our speaker this evening. So if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again. And finally, subtitles are available in this event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So I'm delighted to host the second talk in this series on the wildlife of Campus East. The first talk delivered by Gordon Eastham focused on the creation of Campus East and how the special habitat for numerous species and an ecology laboratory was created. Gordon joined the University of York in 1994 as supervisor of grounds. He was heavily involved in the landscaping of the university's campus east and is now the grounds maintenance manager. Tonight we'll hear from Robin Perutz, who has been a keen amateur observer of campus wildlife on both the old and the new campus. Robin joined the University of York more than 30 years ago his day job has been a professor of chemistry at the university, and his research speciality is chemistry with light, especially utilization of solar energy. In his talk this evening, Robin will celebrate the success of Campus East and suggest why it attracts such different species from Campus West. He will also look at some opportunities that Campus East creates. Once we've heard from Robin, we'll show a short video and Gordon will join us to talk more and take audience questions. So at this point, I'll hand over to Robin to give his presentation. Over to you, Robin. So wilding sounds uh, like herds of bison roaming a university campus. I'm afraid if that's what you expect, uh, you'll be disappointed. No herds of bison. Uh, the largest mammal you'll probably see on the campus is Homo sapiens, uh, and uh, that, that, that that's we're, we're not talking about something quite that ambitious as NEP or other wilding situations. But Campus East has been a huge thrill and for me and really exciting to see how it has developed. Uh, this is a huge achievement from the university and uh, offers lots of possibilities. So if you're not from the University of York, not familiar, the University of York started with uh, a campus uh, built in the 1960s, uh, beautifully landscaped thanks to the principal architect Andrew Derbyshire. It included an old formal yew garden, uh, what was then a new large lake with uh, modern buildings, uh, Central Hall as the key feature, which you see at the right, uh, fine trees, some native, some not native. Uh, and uh, it, it has developed well for wildlife too, but in a very different way from Campus East, as you will see. Uh, Gordon, in his last talk, mentioned the bee orchids. Uh, they're flowering now, so if you want to see a bee orchid, go to campus west, the old campus, and search around and you may uh, find them. There's a photo I took on campus not that long ago. Uh, campus west, the old campus, is uh, well known for its geese. Um, some people hate them, some people love them. On the left, there's a beautiful flock of barnacle geese with a, three grey lags 
close by and on the right you'll see uh, the frozen lake appropriately with the snow geese sitting on the ice that was this this last winter uh, so uh, Gordon in his talk uh, last week told you how uh, the university decided it needed a new campus this was in the noughties and uh, it acquired 120 hectares of uh, wheat field uh, very close by and uh, developed that into the new campus and it was determined to have a fine landscape including a lake again and uh, took this uh, as a real challenge. So uh, in 2005 I was invited along to a landscape planning meeting. Um, there were a whole lot of people around the table. Um, there was a consultant who said we need a big lake but no geese and no fish. Um, uh, there was my uh, ecology colleague Chris from biology who stressed the importance of flower rich grassland uh, and well what did I do? Well I, I, I looked up uh, my notes then and I suggested attracting species from roughly a three mile radius roundabout and I mentioned sand martins and kingfishers, dragonflies, butterflies and a few bigger targets like the water vole and the otter and the barn owl. Uh, so I, I had suggestions for how to do this, building uh, n nest boxes, artificial otter holts and so on. Well, uh, in retrospect, I give myself about five out of ten. Uh, there were some good answers, but how on earth did I miss the even bigger opportunities? So uh, here's a question. Where is the nearest national nature reserve and why is it there? Um, I don't know how many of you in the audience uh, know the answer to this question um, but uh, it's really close by. Uh, so the Lower Derwent Valley National Nature Reserve starts not three miles but five miles from uh, this new campus, uh, not far away at all and none of us around the table as far as I can recall ever mentioned it. Um, so that's why I only get about five out of ten. Um, this nature reserve uh, at its northern end nearest to us uh, it, it starts at Weldrake Ings and it runs along the course of the Derwent through wonderful water meadows uh, which are traditionally managed as hay meadows flooding in winter um, uh, dry or dry-ish in summer uh, and they these meadows are excellent for attracting wildfowl and also uh, flower rich grassland and so on. What's more uh, only two miles south of uh, the the campus is a site of special scientific interest, a triple SI called Heslington Tilmire. So uh, that is damp grassland and both of these offer real potential for connectivity, ecological connectivity to the new campus and that's what we missed at that meeting. Um, so I thought I'd show you a little bit about those the the Heslington Tilmar and the Lower Derwent Valley so you see why there's a connection. Uh, the top left slide is from the pool hide on Weldrake Ings, masses of ducks there. Uh, in winter many thousands of ducks come to that reserve and uh, on the right on the 
Tilmaya, a barn owl. There's a very good population of barn owls co close by and little owl on the lane just by the Tilmaya. Um, now, one of the really special birds that comes to the lower Derwent Valley is the Hooper swan, the usual swan we have uh, in, in, in lakes and rivers in, in, in Britain is the mute swan, of course. Uh, the hoopers fly in non-stop flight from Iceland to Britain uh, in October or November uh, and stay over winter uh, until about April. And in the lower Derwent Valley that you'll find a good many hooper swans uh, in, in, in winter. As for ducks, there, there are literally thousands of them. That bottom photograph you can see is of widgeon and a few teal that I took in the Lower Derwent Valley uh, only a little while ago. So let's have a look how Campus East turned out. Uh, what did, did, did it end up like the original campus or something rather different. Um, so here on the left uh, you can see a meadow sown with co uh, annual flowers that uh, need to be re-sown each year uh, and uh, of course attract a lot of insects. Uh, this is something we didn't have at all on the old campus. And on the right, there's what I call a lagoon. Officially, it's called a detention basin or something uh, rather pompous, but uh, I just call it a lagoon where this uh, balloon has landed. And this has proved particularly attractive to uh, wildlife. Uh, in summer, uh, there's a mass of flowers around the lake. This is now the bigger lake that you see, though you're only looking at a tiny little bit of it there. Uh, hugely successful. It's a very open landscape uh, with a few trees and uh, definitely rather windy, uh, but uh, that open landscape attracts a different sort of wildlife from the old campus. Here you see a winter view taken uh, this last winter. The lake hasn't actually frozen but there's quite a bit of snow and now you can see quite how large the uh, lake really is. Uh, so what sort of uh, birds does it attract? Well um, when I went out for my jog this morning, there was a skylark singing loudly. Uh, so that's one of the key species that has come in. Another is the lapwing, top right. The lapwing is one of our most threatened birds. It used to be really common, but uh, the loss of wet meadows has resulted in huge reductions in numbers of lapwings. Um, Bottom left, the little, little grebes have uh, been very successful. And on the bottom right, the mute swan is the only one of these four birds that you will find on the lake of the old campus, um, or roundabout. Uh, another success story, at least in part, uh, is the sand martin. Uh, the, University invested in in three of these. You see, just two of them. Three of these uh, sand martin nest boxes. They're filled with sand in winter, and the sand martins burrow out their nests uh, through the holes. And for several years, there was a really good population of sand martins. Here they are uh, up on top, sitting on a rope put up by the um, the contractors. 
Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years have been disappointing, <coughs> not because of disturbance, but because of lousy weather uh, uh, at this time of year, which killed the chicks. Uh, so for me, it's a real thrill to see the swallows and martins zooming over the, the lake. Uh, about a month ago, I was there and there were perhaps 200 swallows, house martins and sand martins uh, rushing across the lake. Uh, and uh, no doubt, mainly on their way north uh, on migration. Uh, so this is a really good stopping off point with plenty of insects for them. Uh, in winter, there is a very different set of birds. The water rail, I was taken by surprise by this. I, 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 there, there are usually lots of moorhens feeding and uh, I didn't even bother to look uh, uh, for, uh, for a while. And now I know to really look carefully and see uh, if there's a water rail there. Um, teal. Uh, usually there are 40 or 50 teal uh, it, through the winter on on the lake or on the that lagoon and a few golden eye top right turn up too. Uh, one excitement that I missed entirely because I was away was when the hooper swans landed on the lake coming uh, uh, in October from Iceland and uh, here they saw a fine set of uh, sheet of water uh, to relax on following their big flight. Uh, so it's real plus to get the hoopers in uh, on the on the lake. Uh, there are the visitors, little egrets come quite frequently, occasionally a yellow wagtail, that's the one at the bottom, and um, the Tilmar area has a large population of hares, so it's no surprise that we get some hares coming onto the campus too. Uh, so this, this is a university after all, so we ought to uh, look more seriously at what's going on. And I want to tell you a little bit about the bird ringing and uh, mammal trapping, uh, uh, which tells us about the population of birds and where they come from and perhaps where they're going to. So Colin Beale in the biology department uh, uh, is the person who is fully qualified to ring birds. You, are probably familiar, but in case you aren't, that it is there are little metal rings that go onto the legs of the birds with a number, uh, and that enables you to re record where the birds have been if they're captured again. So this uh, ringing uh, is very good for training biology students uh, and. It's carried out by Colin together with graduate students, postdocs, and uh, academic staff. Uh, and the data he collects, of course, goes to the British Trust for Ornithology for their national scheme. But the results uh, also assist Gordon to, with the conservation planning. So here are two spectacular captures, this wonderful woodcock with its mottled pattern on the left and a kingfisher uh, on, on the right. So we really do have kingfishers occasionally. Uh, the campus has also proved very good for those little brown birds, little brown jobs uh, that uh, come in summer, these are three are all summer migrants. Uh, the reed warblers uh, populate the reeds uh, alongside the lake, as do the sedge warblers, and there's a black cap too, which you may see 
you may see black caps in your garden. So altogether, uh, Colin and his team have uh, ringed four, more than 400 birds, both in 2020 and 2019, 33 species in 2020, 27 and 2019. And one of the findings is that there's a really high population of reed warblers. That's this bird at the top left. Uh, and the ringing proved that there's movement of these reed warblers, reed bunting and bullfinch from the lower Derwent Valley to Campus East. So this really vindicates uh, my uh, theory about how the campus has developed. Uh, there are other ringing recoveries uh, where we can say that the birds came from the south of France, from Sussex and from um, Aberdeenshire. Uh, as for the mammals, uh, a wood mouse is pretty well expected, but Charles Cunningham also captured a water shrew. He tells me it was a really lousy wet day, so the photograph up top here is rather poor, and I took a photograph off the internet to show you what a water shrew looks like, but that's a really unusual find uh, to have on the campus. Uh, so what about the flowers? Uh, in April, the little ditches are covered in water crowfoot and the reeds uh, still have their sort of winter plumage, you might say. Uh, but uh, c come May and June, uh, it all becomes much more colourful. So on the left, the, the, we have a, the meadow covered in cow's lips and um, that the April, early May, uh, later May and early June, uh, that same meadow covered in buttercups and uh, in the foreground, ragged robin. Um, the, those two photographs are, are taken of all, at almost the same positions. The tree you see in each uh, is the self same tree. So you see the succession during the year uh, on these photos. Uh, the campus has also attracted orchids. Uh, they've come there by themselves. Uh, uh, on the left of very pale specimens of common spotted orchid and in the middle of the marsh orchid. Uh, this morning when I went to the campus there were lots of absolutely magnificent marsh orchids uh, in full bloom and the common spotted orchids just opening. So you can go and have a look yourselves if you're uh, in York. Um, Broom rape is a parasitic plant uh, uh, that's more like July than June, uh, also found on the campus. And uh, the, the, the campus also proves very, very successful for insects. The centerpiece here is the blue damselfly, a male blue damselfly, uh, and uh, bottom left, uh, a sort of dragonfly called a black-tailed skimmer. That's the female. The male is more colorful. Um, and uh, butterflies to a skipper uh, on the viper's bugloss at top left and uh, beautiful fresh tortoise shells uh, bottom right. Uh, the cinnabar moth lives on ragwort. Uh, or that's its food plant, uh, and uh, there were quite a lot of these cinnabar moths last year. So as for the geese, well, hmm, the geese didn't talk to the consultant, I'm afraid, um, and in winter we end up with several hundred geese on the lake and on the grassland around, and uh, last week when I was on campus, there's Canada geese with two 
young just hatched, so uh, they're breeding on the campus too. Sorry, consultant, um, you didn't get that right. Um, so as for a little bit of numbers, uh, if we compare the new campus east and the old one, um, th there are five species of wintering ducks that I see regularly on campus east, totally absent from the campus west, and uh, more than 10 species of breeding bird that again, present on campus east regularly, but absent from the west. So uh, Colin has uh, ringed uh, 40 species of birds, 100 species of moths have been identified. So this is really one of the best wildlife sites within the city of York boundary. And the way it's developed is fully consistent with that connection to the Lower Derwent Valley National Nature Reserve. Uh, so I want to move on a little bit. Um, thinking about Campus East as a laboratory uh, and what we on the in the university do to make use of uh, the campus for research. Uh, so key, a key feature for any successful lake is in the water quality. Maintenance of the water quality really matters and um, Alistair Boxall from the Department of Environment uh, gave me these slides. This is an autonomous mini catamaran for measuring the water quality. And with it, he's able to make a lot of different measurements uh, across the lake. Uh, and what we find is that nitrate, which is a uh, an unwanted iron, uh, unwanted, it comes uh, principally as runoff from fields uh, which have been fertilized. That nitrate level is nicely low for most of the lake. So dark green there tells you that there's a low level of nitrate. Dissolved oxygen, in contrast, is something we want plenty of for the plants and uh, for the, uh, 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 sorry, for the plankton in there and for the fish. So red here is good, a high level of dissolved oxygen. And indeed, throughout the lake, the level of dissolved oxygen is uh, really uh, very, very healthy. So that's one sort of measurement. Uh, and related to that, uh, students in biology and the environment and geography department have measured the algae in the lake, both in Campus West and in Campus East, and there's 20 times more algal biomass in the Campus West, a much less healthy lake than Campus East. And the dissolved oxygen is indeed lower in Campus West than Campus East. Now, one of the other projects has looked at the plant biodiversity. So at the start, the grasslands were sown with a really rich mix of seeds. Uh, and then there were some lawns and the nature reserve also got a nice seed mix. Those three different types of area were compared and uh, only the nature reserve reached the target of 15 plant species per square meter. Uh, what's more, as the years went by from 2011 to 2018, the, uh, what we saw was a reduction in the number of plant species and 
no more than a quarter of the species originally sown remain. So plant diversity has actually gone down uh, with time. At the top right, you see a photograph with masses of vipers bugloss. I'd be very surprised if you could, will be able to see a mass of them this year. Uh, they've become really greatly reduced in numbers, only a few here and there. Uh, now, it's not just the biologists and environment students who can make use of the campus. Paul Mitchell from Electronic Engineering gave me uh, this uh, slide uh, and he's developing underwater communication networks so that you can make measurements uh, underwater. For instance, you might be measuring nitrate or some other parameter and the idea of the uh, network is to communicate really rapidly uh, back to a node and then to shore where you would have your laptop uh, and uh, your co computing facilities. So at the bottom you see some of the uh, students looking across the, the lake. They've been uh, working, trying out their boys uh, with the sensors on them to do this sort of measurement. Uh, we weren't um, the first people to live on Campus East, uh, uh, so it turned out. When the uh, university first developed the campus, uh, there was an archaeological survey and the uh, prehistoric burial was discovered, uh, which actually contained a well-preserved human brain, uh, well-preserved because of the waterlogged site. Uh, it was dated, as you can see, to something between 673 and 482 BC, a man uh, aged between 26 and 45. And this led to a couple of nice publications because, as you can imagine, there are not many sites that yield a human brain. The usual thing is, of course, the skeleton. So I th thought we should just uh, consider whether there aren't some more opportunities to make use of the campus. Um, so research at the undergraduate project level, that seems to be going well. Uh, at the level of full publications, not much use as far as I can make out being made of the campus. Uh, as for student education, ecology, definitely a big tick. Uh, landscape planning, I don't know whether any of that is uh, being uh, taught uh, at the University of York. Certainly it does at the University of Sheffield and Sheffield students used to come and visit our old campus in days when visits were possible. Uh, to my mind, uh, this Campus East is a real exemplar for local and national biodiversity planning, but is anything being done about that? I'm not sure. Uh, if there are potential students who are interested in biodiversity, shouldn't they be encouraged to come to York and enjoy and make use of this campus. So I asked admissions whether they used the campus to attract students, but too bad, no reply at all. Uh, this should be a resource for schools too. Uh, uh, biological science for primary schools, bring some primary school children here, uh, but I don't think much of that is happening. And uh, it is somewhere for the well-being for 
of staff and students uh, and uh, uh, couldn't we do a bit more about that? Gordon produced a lovely pamphlet of, with a nature walk, unfortunately with building on site and uh, this has really become rather obsolete and it wasn't that well publicized. Uh, the campus really is a great resource for the city. It does attract walkers and bird watchers. It's the site for the park run. But again, I feel that we could do a lot more. Uh, the, at the moment, the university is building a new college with several large buildings very close to the lagoon. You can see the lagoon there in the picture and with these buildings going right up to the edge. So far, so good. Uh, the uh, wildlife doesn't seem too bothered by the cranes and the uh, noise and the contractors, but will they tolerate students running all over the place? I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, but certainly the seclusion of this lagoon is being put at risk. Uh, so I thought we'd just have a look at uh, the university's sustainability strategy and see what it intends to do and think about what actually happens. So what you see here are the university's objectives in their sustainability strategy, uh, protect and enhance biodiversity, embed natural environment issues within taught courses and skills training, address sustainability in induction professional development and training for staff and students, promote nature conservation through habitat creation and enhancement, protect, promote teaching and research activities that have a positive environmental value. Well, that's all fantastic. Um, if it's not to be motherhood and apple pie, somebody needs to check that these things actually happen. And that's where I'm at the moment uh, unconvinced or uncertain that things are happening. Are the architects and contractors properly briefed? Is there an environmental impact assessment when there are new developments? Is the training and teaching actually happening? Uh, are new buildings compensated by more investment in conservation? So the university has a brand new team at the top. Uh, all of this development was really done before they arrived and uh, they have the opportunity now uh, to really ensure that the sustainability objectives happen and that we maintain this. So thinking of the big picture, the UK is really in a lousy position on biodiversity. You've probably heard about the 90 plus percent loss of uh, grasslands and uh, species rich grasslands and so on. Uh, biodiversity is the twin problem to climate change. They go hand in hand. So this contribution of Campus East for, by the university really makes a difference. So that uh, is a fantastic contribution. Uh, so I'd like to finish by saying a big thank you to the university for turning a really unpromising set of wheat fields into a wildlife haven, but just implore them, please be proud of what you've achieved and keep it up. Don't let it degenerate. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd like to thank Gordon Easton. He's worked with me on the, uh, preparing the, the, this presentation and his own and 
it's really thanks to Gordon that we have such a successful campus. I'd also like to thank Charles Cunningham, Colin Beale and Claire Hughes for material for this uh, presentation uh, and also uh, 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 Mitchell, Paul Mitchell from the Electronic Engineering and Alistair Boxall. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul Shields for video footage, which you'll see in a few minutes, and I particularly thank Ron and Barbara Cook, who have sponsored this event, but I want to do, thank them really for their friendship for, uh, uh, in the university for many, many years. If you're interested, all the photos that were unattributed were taken by me on the location specified, with the one exception of the lapwing, which I took on the Tilmire rather than on Campus East. Thank you so much, Robin, for a really fascinating presentation um, with some really fantastic photography as well. Um, so it's so a well done. Nice. So if you have any questions for Gordon or Robin, please submit them using the Q&A function um, that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have had some questions submitted already. Um, so I will uh, just have a look at those now. Um, so, uh, so the first question is that you have quite a number of varying environments in the campus. Would all of them coexist in nature or did you select certain environments for the campus? Um, Gordon, do you want to start the answer on that? Um, yeah, I can do, Robin. I think probably the short answer to that is um, the, um, the habitats that we created were suggested largely by the, um, by the landscape consultants. Um, they were, they were um, judged to be best for um, uh, increasing the biodiversity of the site um, as, as, as quickly as we possibly could, I expect. Things like the woodland and the species, species rich meadowland. So that's that's probably the, the short answer to it. Um, the lake, of course, we wanted a lake, um, probably um, not just for its um, um, its its function as um, as part of the surface water drainage system, but also because water is the absolutely best habitat for increasing biodiversity that there is. So I think that's probably the answer to the question from my point of view. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so is there anything to add there, Robin, or should we move I on? I don't to... think so, move on. Okay, let's move on to the next question. We've got some really great questions in, in the Q&A. So, okay, so the next one is, could you say something about the hare population, please? There were very numerous 10 years ago and now seem to be non-existent as far as David can see. What are the reasons and could they be adjusted in the hare's favour? Uh, right. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether uh, David is referring to the campus or to the wider area. Uh, uh, in the wider area, uh, certainly within a, a few miles, I've seen a lot of hares very recently. Uh, perhaps not quite as many as a few years ago, but certainly uh, if you go to the Heslington Tilmar, see them, I've uh, done a little survey near Elvington and uh, seen seven hares together chasing each other round and round. As far as the campus is concerned, uh, the visits from hares seem much rarer uh, and I think that reflects uh, uh, the greater human activity that there is on campus, uh, but I haven't done any research on that. Okay, great. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, if you wanted to, to add a further comment on that, David, please feel free in the Q&A. 
Okay, so we'll move on to the next one, um, which is from, from another David. Um, so Heslington East attracts many dog walkers. Is there a conflict with protecting plant and animal species and should dog walking be banned or discouraged on the site? I think that's for Gordon to answer. Um, yeah, the, well, the, the, the simple answer to that is yes, there is a conflict between uh, between dog walking and the uh, and the wildlife on campus. Um, I I don't uh, I don't propose that we that we we ban dog walking or dog walkers, but I think that we we do try to restrict certain areas and discourage them from from going into those areas uh, where we. Uh, where we want to leave it as a haven for wildlife. Um, we've, we've tried to do this um, with signage, polite signage in the past, um, but uh, we find that uh, it very, very seldom works, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might be that we now have to think about, um, you know, more drastic measures to do this. We've, we've certainly started putting barriers in in some places uh, we've put one or two dead hedges around to try and keep people out of areas where we don't want them to go. Um, but I think, you know, we perhaps need a little bit more signage up around that kind of thing and, not, and, and to try and encourage people to keep dogs on the lead as well. Mm. It's, it's particularly important during the, the nesting and the breeding season for birds. And if we can sort of, we can, if we can raise public awareness of that, then I think that's probably the, the best way to go with it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gordon. Great. OK, uh, questions are coming in thick and fast, so we'll we'll move on to the next one. Um, so we have a question in from from Anne um, wondering why you seeded the grassland with seeds from elsewhere and didn't wait to see what grew naturally over time. Would there be a seed bank of arable wildflowers from the former wheat fields that could be better adapted to the soil conditions? So plant biodiversity may have developed more slowly, but then may not have declined as you observed. Gordon, can you take that? Um, yes, I'll, I'll, cer I'll, certainly, I'll certainly try to answer. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, it's it's probably a fair point, and we we could have we could have tried that in certain areas, but I think the decision was taken to uh, to have species rich grassland in in uh, in many locations across the campus, and uh, we didn't really consider that. I think there would have been quite a quite a considerable seed bank in the soil. I mean, the other thing to to take into account as well is we had to do a lot of soil inversion. To, uh, to try and make conditions more favorable for wildflowers to establish anyway. So a lot of the, a lot of the topsoil, um, a lot of the seed would have been buried as part of the, um, as part of the soil inversion operation, as part of the muck shifting operation. So I don't know, I don't know how successful that would have been, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's something we'll never know, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I can just, just add that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the species on the campus, uh, for most of it, are certainly native species that you would find uh, here in Yorkshire anyway. Uh, only on the annuals will you find species that are not native, and there are not very many of them. Great, thanks, uh, Robin. So th there is a, a kind of follow up question from that. So did the cowslips appear naturally on the site or were they originally planted? Uh, me again, I think, Claire. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. no, the, the, the cowslips were, were uh, incorporated in the original uh, species rich meadow lamb mixes. So um, yeah, they were, they, they were in there from the start and they've, uh, They've done particularly well, which we're, we're all very pleased about, and um, they just flower and um, every year and produce more seed every year. So um, I don't know; we might just be knee deep in cowslips in another five years' time. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Gordon. Um, so we have a question about the bird ringing project. Um, so Ruth's asking, can members of the public get involved in the bird ringing project? So I don't know if you know anything about that, Robin. Ah, uh, that, uh, that's an interesting question. And uh, uh, so uh, in order to uh, 
be a qualified ringer, you've certainly got to have training, uh, and uh, that that's essential. Uh, but uh, if you want to see it in action, I would suggest that you contact Colin Beale at the university. You'll find his email easily enough on Google and see whether he'd be willing for you to uh, come along next time he's out there ringing. Uh, that is indeed what I did myself. Great. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, great advice there. So um, our final question that we have in the Q&A at the moment is from Derek. So will there be much more encroachment on the nature reserve by new buildings and students? <laughs> well, that, that is the $64,000 question. Um, I, I, and uh, uh, that I cannot answer. Um, except to say that over the years the university has put more and more buildings on the old campus, Campus West, until it's really run out of space, which is why it started the new campus. And uh, I uh, uh, just hope that as the new campus, Campus East, develops, the university will respect and understand uh, in a positive way what it has achieved and think carefully about how to develop. And that's really the gist of what I was saying at the end. Uh, it's something to be really proud of uh, where we are now, uh, but it's just so easy to destroy what you've achieved. Okay, thanks very much, Robin. Um, so we don't have any further Q&A questions in. Oh, no, we do have um, uh, one's just popped in. So uh, where's the best place to see a water rail? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Um, uh, the only area I have seen water rails is by uh, what I call the top lagoon. Um, so if you go across the road, uh, coming from Church Lane, across Field Lane, go straight on. Uh, uh, at the moment, you will come to a dead end because of the builder's fence. But just to your left is the, uh, is the lagoon I mentioned, and to the right, there are reed beds. And that is where I have seen water rail in that in that that area uh, and uh, cer certainly uh, uh, there were several reports of water rail there uh, but of course they are uh, birds that tend to hide uh, if you if you uh, listen on uh, uh, you, you, you can Google the calls of the water rail and learn what it sounds like, and that may help you spot a water rail. So that's something you can do to help matters. Great. Thanks very much, Robin. So David's just come back to say thank you. I saw the Savis warbler there. So uh, we'll move on to, to another question, So, which, which is a great one. Have the speakers noticed differences in the amounts of wildlife while the campuses have had restricted access? Mm. Uh, Are you going to take that, Robin? Well, I can, I can try. Um, uh, it, th this is a, a tricky question because I'm restricted. Uh, like everybody else, to keep out from where the builders are working. Um, so I don't know the answer as far as that's concerned, um, but there uh, do seem to be uh, some patches at the moment that are particularly rich in orchids. Uh, it may be a good orchid year. It may be that the uh, lack of disturbance has helped the orchids. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the thing is that 
there's so much variation year on year uh, uh, thanks to uh, the weather that it's very difficult to uh, be sure about the origin of changes on a short time scale from one year to the next and we've as you know we've had a really cold spring this year and a very warm one last year so there are big differences great thank you robin anything to add there gordon uh, well, I, th I suppose the only thing that I would say, Claire, is that I, Robin, as Robin rightly points out, we've, we've got a large construction site on Campus East at the moment. But I think um, during, the, um, during the coronavirus pandemic, I think we've probably seen a rise in people actually using campus, um, passive recreational activity, that kind of thing. Um, and so you, you if, if 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 there are more people using the campus you, you probably tend to see less of the wildlife really because it's uh, it's frightened off but i think it's very very difficult to say because obviously the student population has been lower but i think that the um, you know the general public coming onto campus we've we've seen we've seen higher higher numbers of people in that respect so it's a, it is it's a bit of a balancing act really yeah can I just add to, to just uh, add that the you know the public is most welcome on campus and uh, uh, that it's it, it's really an amenity for everybody to enjoy. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, great. Thank you very much both. Uh, so unfortunately, time has flown fast and uh, we have to now draw the event to a close. Um, but I think this has been an absolutely fantastic event. Um, so huge thank you to Robin and Gordon for their presentations and for answering all of the questions that have come through today. Um, and huge thanks to everyone on the call uh, for joining us this evening, uh, but for also submitting questions as well. Um, that's been very much appreciated and has created a really vibrant event. So the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website after the 20th of June, and you'll be contacted by email when the video is available to view. Um, if you missed the first talk in the series by Gordon, um, it's available to watch again on the on YouTube um, and to access that recording, just visit the YorkFestivalOfIdeas.com website to find out more. So, yeah, we very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. And if you want to find out more about events, um, then, uh, yeah, please uh, take a look at the, the event website. So, yeah, once again, thank you very much to, to everybody who's been involved in, in setting up this event. Um, I, I think it's been fantastic and uh, I've certainly learned a lot as well. So thank you very much, everyone.